All right, hi folks, Bearpaw7 here. We are uh, currently in the book of Matthew today in this uh, Bible study segment uh, with Bearpaw7. Sometimes we do bodybuilding and sometimes we just do Bible. And uh, this segment is in uh, New Testament and uh, as I said, we are currently in the book of Matthew, and today, Matthew chapter 20. I'm actually kind of getting excited about finishing up uh, Matthew, and then we're going to jump to the Old Testament and uh, begin uh, the study of the book of Genesis. So I'm actually uh, looking uh, forward to that quite a bit. Uh, we touched on the book of Genesis um, two or three times. Uh, during the uh, Bible and uh, bodybuilding segments. I think uh, we hit it once in a, one of the squat uh, sessions and uh, maybe a couple of upper, upper body uh, sessions. You can go check that out if you want. I don't really remember which one, but you can scan through them and uh, maybe get a little bodybuilding uh, excitement when you uh, go through them. And uh, so we're in the Bears gym today, but we're going to do a little uh, Bible study in uh, the New Testament, uh, book of Matthew, chapter 20, and here we go. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto the steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto the last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. That's kind of a heavy uh, verse there. And uh, in this day and age, you know, with the, uh, the sports athlete, everybody wants more of the pie. Um, in the world, you know, if one guy gets uh, an extra hour of overtime, he wants the hour of overtime. Uh, one guy gets the bonus, the other guy wants the bonus. That's kind of the way it is. But in the body of Christ, we serve for one sense to inherit our place in the kingdom of God with Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father and with all the brethren that love him for all of eternity. That is our goal. We don't, 
we really, um, I personally don't know if I agree with all the, you know, you're earning up riches in heaven by, you know, a bigger, you get a bigger purse of gold in heaven or whatever. I'm not sure if I really agree with that. In reality, who really cares? When you get to heaven and you, you have accomplished the work here on earth and you were given uh, your crown, as it may be, um, in heaven uh, for a successful uh, mission on this earth of uh, enduring to the end um, through thick and thin. Um, as a kind of a side note, that's kind of what marriage is, um, through thick and thin, uh, till death do us part. That's kind of also the picture of Christ and the church. Uh, I don't want to divulge too far in that, but in any marriage, um, there's going to be happy and joyful times, and there's going to be hard and uh, uh, enduring times because that is life. And so you must take the good, as the book of Job says. Can we accept uh, good from God only and not evil? And evil and not good? I mean, you're going to hit both uh, mountains and valleys in your lifetime. And we must uh, roll with it and move on. And yet still God, give God the glory because he is worthy. And in the marriage uh, setting, uh, many people become discouraged in the marriage uh, as the years trudge on, that um, the marriage was not uh, like they anticipated. They thought uh, it was just going to be uh, like the honeymoon and the dating relationship all over again for years and years. Uh, and they're shell-shocked when um, the wife or the husband says, I'm, I'm leaving, I'm, you know, I'm sick and tired of this, and, and they have to work it out through hard uh, uh, decision-making processes and uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's not what they anticipated. And uh, so, but nonetheless, it's not a matter of uh, how many troubles you wade through to get to the finish line. What matters is you finish to the finish line. That's what matters. And so here we go. Uh, this vineyard owner offered, you know, I'm reading from the King James here, and it says, a penny. Well, a penny in those days probably meant a whole lot more than what a penny means uh, today. Um, uh, <laughs> I hate to digress again, but just kind of giving a, a quick reference. Uh, back, if you look at some of the old-fashioned uh, catalogs, you know, have some huge thing that you can buy for a penny um, or you get two for a penny. Um, today, you know, I got a whole basket of pennies over there that sits and uh, uh, nobody really wants because it's, you know, they want folding money, they want green money. And um, just because the penny doesn't, you know, really probably cost more to make than it's actually, you know, worth. And But in these days, a penny meant something. So don't let that, you know, shake you off a little bit. A penny, a penny is worth nothing. Well. A penny is equal to a day's labor in those days. So let's say you work an eight-hour day, you're making seven, eight bucks an hour. You know, you're in the, let's say, $40 range. So just view it like that. You know, paid them 40 bucks, $40. Something like that, okay. And, uh, you know, the guy's out there laboring, you know, 10, 11, 12 hours. And... Uh, they come back in, and uh, the guys that started last actually got paid first. And by the time the guys had been laboring all day, they got laid, they assumed they were going to get more. And uh, uh, the vineyard owner said, no, you're going to get what you agreed upon. And uh, that's the first thing in this little uh, parable, is to be content uh, with what you were uh, uh, contracted for uh, and your wages. It's just uh, contentment is sometimes a dis difficult challenge in our lives. Um, you know, in this day and age, you know, the media circles are so, they're, uh, they're advertising, well, look at all this, you know, the, the rich and famous and so forth. But you know what? These rich and famous, they're not very happy. And uh, so don't, don't be fooled by the, 
you know, the Hollywood, the political set, the athletic set, you know, they're frequently committing suicide and, and multiple divorces and, and terrible lives, even though they got the money and the publicity and uh, they're not happy. They're not happy because they're not in Christ. You can only be happy in Christ. Uh, and happiness is something that's not just showing teeth and bubbly joyful all the time. It's a contentment and a joy that's in Christ of, of knowing that, that whatever happens, God will see you through it, um, though through possibly hard times, you will make it, and it's for the glory of God, for the glory of our Heavenly Father, and through the power of Jesus Christ, His Son, in through the Holy Spirit. And um, we're going to have struggles, and the kind of the aura of the movies and the music and the billboards is that, you know, hey, look how much fun we're having with this thing. Well, the, the earthly joy is fleeting. You know, we won the Super Bowl. We won the big basketball game. This year you did, you know, or last year you did, but then, you know, a couple of years you're forgotten. Nobody even knows who, who won it last year. And uh, so the, the pleasures and the, and the, the gratifications of this world are very short-lived. And so shifting back now to our um, uh, little parable here, it's very uh, important to realize that though we labor hard, maybe longer than others, we're going to receive the same prize. And there's going to be nothing sad about that. It's going to be glorious and wonderful that when this body of bear paw seven goes, that uh, I'm not going to be sad to leave it behind. I'm going to look forward to my reward in heaven with my almighty Father and with Jesus Christ and all my brothers and sisters in Christ that I don't even know now, that uh, I will get to know in heaven and uh, perhaps uh, a little bit of uh, understanding of the ages past and what went on. That's, gonna, that's exciting to me, um, um, to, to know what, what, what went on, Lord, what, what happened. Before all of this, what, what was it? You know, it's, my mind is intrigued by that. And, uh, and I can't really grasp it. My mind really couldn't grasp it, if you even told me right now. So, uh, but anyway, I'm kind of excited for that. So realize that regardless of how long we labor, endure, and make it to the end. Finish the race to please the Lord. It's about pleasing the Lord, not everybody around you. It's about pleasing Christ. Anyway, let me get off my soapbox here as I've been on it a long time. So here we go, let's move along. I'm just gonna move along to uh, verse 17 here. I had a couple other things I wanted to say, but I'm gonna move along, lest I camp out there too long. Verse 17 of Matthew chapter 20, and Jesus going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. The sobering reality of little Jesus uh, in a manger, the wise men coming, the star in the heavens shining down on this little child. He was born for one purpose, to die on behalf of the sins of the world. It's a sobering reality that we don't really know at what age um, Jesus uh, understood this. Perhaps he understood it while yet in the womb. We Probably he did. We don't really know. But he came to die. And that day, he death on a cross. Slow, asphyxiating death on a cross. Brutal. But he came to die and offer up his body for the sins of of the worlds that 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 those who would choose his forgiveness and his salvation 
would inherit eternal life. He did it for that purpose. Verse 20, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children, with her sons worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. The chain of command and authority in heaven is um, very uh, orderly. Our Heavenly Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit it being empowered by them and through them and in them and all. The Holy Spirit appearing to have some seven um, flames, seven fingers, some seven uh, manifestations, seven uh, entities within the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's really kind of unknown how that all kind of comes about. But there's something kind of a sevenness about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit moves and works throughout the Father through the Son. And that is an orderly chain um, that the Son honors and God the Father honors. Um, God the Father calls Jesus God. Jesus calls God the Father God, but also my Heavenly Father. So there is a chain of command, and they are one, but Jesus is the Son, and the Heavenly Father is the Heavenly Father. He is the superior, the almighty superior, um, Godhead of all creation. Jesus is the creator of all creation. God gave him um, the power, the instruction, the uh, whatever, and Jesus made what the Father wanted happen. He is the Almighty God. Um, the Holy Spirit then moves, as it says in Genesis, broods upon the surface of the waters. Um, and so there is a chain of command, a heavenly chain of command. And one day, um, Jesus will turn all authority and power over to the Father. We're not really sure how that that works out, but it um, doesn't mean he won't be God anymore. He will be God. He's always God. God will always be God. But there's something about turning over the keys of heaven and hell and all that. And we're not really sure how that works out. I'm really not sure how that works out. Um, God knows, and, uh, and that's all that really matters. He's given us a little bit of insight into what's going to happen, but we, it's impossible to understand fully what's going to go on in heaven in the ages to come. Uh, anyway, um, the mother of uh, James and John wanted a little special spot uh, for her sons. Uh, Jesus basically said, um, they can partake of my sufferings and they drink the cup but to receive these places on my left and my right, that is something that the Father will bestow out in the heavenly realm. Just made it very clear. It wasn't rude, just kind of told him, her uh, the way it is. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, 
let him be your minister. And whoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. We live in a day and age, once again, you know, where the, the minister, the reverend, as they call him, you know, father, or whatever, um, are greatly honored. And to some extent, there's a truth. The other extent, you know, we, we take it to the extreme. And so, therefore, you know, when they stumble and fall, you know, when it comes out on the media set, you know, that brings great shame um, to Christ. And, uh, but we, we really have to understand um, that there's uh, the greatest thing on this earth is to love and honor Jesus Christ in whatever aspect he has given to you. Uh, me and my trade and my family and whatever, that's all that I can do. A little bit of Bible teaching, the Church of the Living Room, um, whatever little aspect that I have in my life, that's all that I can do. I cannot have a hope to be, I want to be, you know, uh, whatever, you know. Uh, I have no really aspirations. Uh, for anything higher than just what God puts in front of me to do. Uh, there are some that are, uh, uh, they represent various uh, church organizations. A very, you know, they got the robe thing, they got the collars and the hats and all that, and that's, you know, good for them. And, um, but each, each individual has to make sure to remember that they are there as servants of God. Not to be glorified, but to be there as servants unto God and ministers to minister unto the people. Because the Gentiles love to be, go up the corporate ladder, you know, and then, you know, exalt that authority over those under them and kind of oppress them. That's, that's kind of the way of the world, but that's not the way it should be in the body of Christ. All right, verse 29. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. Two blind men. Here we go once again. He just got done talking about, you know, how the Son of Man came to minister. Got two blind men. Who, who else? would need to be ministered in that day and age. Blind men, you know, the, the, the suffering that they went through, the poverty they went through, being blind. Uh, man, who more needed to be ministered to? And But the crowd wanted them to, to hush them up and shove them off, say, shut up, you know, get out of here. Um, and the multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What wilt ye that I shall do unto you? Now that's a good that's a good God right there. Got blind men crawling out from their little, you know, stupors and their little, you know, places they're hiding out, maybe under trees or embankments or whatever, you know, because blind people were poor. You know, uh, they, they didn't have institutions like we have now. And, you know, they have little bed and breakfasts and so forth. They had it rough. Not that blind people don't have it rough now. They, they do. But these people had it rough. And Jesus said, hey, what do you want me to do for you? Wow. They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. And if I was blind, that's what I'd ask for too. So Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight. And then what did they do? They went back home to their families, wrote a book, got rich. What did they do? I'll tell you what they did. It's what each and every one of us should do. It says, and they followed him. 
If you learn anything from all my little videos here on uh, wherever you're watching them on whatever uh, software generated device, whatever platform, if you learn anything, it is this, that God is crying out to the world's people to follow him because he has the answers to all of your questions. And the answer to pretty much all of our questions are somehow, why am I here? Is there more than this? What is my purpose? God has the answers for you. And they are in Christ Jesus. No other religion, no pseudo-churchianity, no ism. Only in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the answer. This is where your answers and your road will begin. And he would say to you, follow me. The blind men, they were wise men. And they knew the right thing to do. And they followed him. So, when my life is worn to the end, if I see the end coming, I hope and my joy will be as I see that day coming that I know that I've followed him. And friend, if you haven't followed him or perhaps you've made a lot of mistakes, stop right now. Make it, make it clear, make it simple. Say, God, I haven't followed you well. I've fallen. It's very simple. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me and remember me when you come in your kingdom and also right now. Forgive me. And then, friend, follow him with all your heart. Read his word, give it everything you got, and understand it the best you can, and he'll see you through. So, in Christ, friends, God bless you. Until we uh, meet again, and I bid you God bless, God speed, and may the Lord be with you. Talk to you later, friend.